Hello and welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. I'm Malcolm Borthwick, Managing Editor at Bailey Gifford. In the ever-changing world of investment management, the past five years have been a roller coaster. There's been COVID, advances in artificial intelligence, and an end to low interest rates. It's been a transformative period. It's also been five years since our partner, Stuart Dunbar, published his provocative paper, Let's Talk About Actual Investing. In it, he urged the investment industry to focus on allocating capital to companies, rather than fixating on share prices, arguing that it's visionary entrepreneurs and company leaders that generate profits, not stock markets. And that in the long term, this approach was far more likely to create value for society than abstract concepts and short-term speculation. So, with so much having transpired since, does Stuart still stand by this thesis? Well, we'll find out in a moment. But first, a quick reminder that as with all investments, your capital is at risk and your income is not guaranteed. Stuart, great to have you back on Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thank you, Malcolm. It's very hard to believe it's been five years, but <laughs> great to be back. So, at the heart of this thesis of actual investing, it seems to be about companies and capital allocation. This seems quite a basic concept, or am I missing something? It is a basic concept, and I think it's one that doesn't really change. Since we last did this, what's changed? I think the answer is everything and nothing. Nobody could have observed pattern of stock market returns in the last three or four years, certainly post during and post-COVID, and not come to the conclusion that what on earth is going on here? Do we need to start worrying much more about how markets behave rather than how companies behave? And I actually think that this is where it's very valuable to step back and say there are some things we just can't control. What have we really learned in respect of growth companies? What we've learned is, is the market can get very, very overexcited and then very, very gloomy. And the difference in prices between great excitement and great gloominess is really very dramatic. Now, what are we supposed to do with that? I think this is the point about nothing's changed we can't predict how that's going to work out. I mean, if the last three years have shown anything, is just that these swings of emotion can get even more extreme than we thought they could. What can we do? We can keep on focusing on companies. We can keep on focusing on opportunity. And we can keep on looking how we're allocating capital in the real world. So that bit hasn't changed at all. But, you know, you would be... Um, I don't think it would be reasonable to say that we haven't been scratching our heads and wondering if the last three years have, have taught us anything. So your core thesis remains the same? Absolutely the same. I mean, I think it has to be. There are active investors out there, and we spoke about this five years ago, who may have skills in market timing, who may be able to anticipate what other investors are going to do and therefore what the market's going to do. I think there are very few people that can do that. It's very hard to do it consistently. And even those that do eventually, pretty much, I think all of them have got it wrong eventually. I think it's far, I'm not saying it's an easy job, but it's a far, far more doable task is to actually try and understand companies and the opportunities they have and the direction of travel they're going in. And you talk about the wider market there. Um, is the purpose of actual investing to focus on Bailey Gifford's purpose and our approach, or is it to influence a wider industry? Yeah, that's... I, I mean, our job is to deliver for our clients. You know, we're not actually here to make the world a better place. I mean, it would be a nice thing if we could do that along the way. But, no, first and foremost, there's got to be, let's find these companies that we think are potentially great let's understand let's explain to clients how we're going to go about doing that so that they don't all get spooked i mean one of the big challenges that an investment approach such as ours a long-term investment approach has if the clients don't fully understand the nature of it they will trade in and out of funds or allocate to and from us in, in a way that can be quite damaging for them typically the sort of buying at the top and selling at the bottom so so let's focus on that we're still trying to do that for clients what's Interesting internally, um, I've certainly found since you know, Bailey Gifford, is I feel we encourage very much uh, independence of thought, federal thinking, our strategies to think differently and be entrepreneurial. Within that environment, is it possible to have this overarching actual investing philosophy? <laughs> yes. So I'll answer that from two different directions. One is when we alighted on this notion that we should call ourselves actual investors, it wasn't just some made up thing that I came up with. It was a reflection of many discussions about what are the common beliefs that we want people to follow in our firm. And so that is 
long-termism and conviction and patience and alternative sources of information and a focus on real-world capital allocation. So I think we can apply all of those characterizations to what all of our investment teams do. But then you have the value of autonomy, which is they're not all, they don't all have the same strategies. In the main, we're an equity growth house, but there are more and less aggressive forms of approaching that growth task. But we also have multi-asset and income strategies that have different objectives. The common factors are still there, but the way that the individual investment teams apply that needs to be suitable to their own philosophy and their own strategy. The different strategies that we offer are often quite different from each other. But I think these overriding principles of actual investing actually can apply across the whole firm. And we do hold ourselves reasonably accountable to our activities. It's quite used to be able to check back and, you know, of course we are, but are we are we investing with conviction? Are we being long term? Are we ignoring short term share price moves? And yes, we are. But it's quite it's quite useful to have that sort of a checklist to hold ourselves accountable against, I think. I mean, Bailey Gifford is unequivocally a growth investor. But what's interesting is looking back at portfolios 15 years ago, a lot of listeners might be surprised to know that the likes of Petrobras, Nokia, and these type of companies like Vodafone were in the portfolio. Why is that and what's changed? That's where we thought the growth was coming from back then. I mean, that's a really interesting question because it raises, in hindsight, did we have the right companies? Did we identify where growth was going to come from on a five, ten year view, whatever? And in some cases, we'll have got that right. In those days, we weren't thinking about the death of fossil fuels and oil and gas not coming out of the ground as stranded assets. I mean, maybe some people were thinking about it 15 years ago, but not really. So it's the same task then as it was now. Where do we see blue sky sustained growth coming from? And we thought those were the right firms. I mean, I think Nokia, certainly towards the end, Nokia was a disaster, of course. Why did we think Nokia was a great firm? Because we hadn't at that stage worked out that they were going to be completely overtaken technologically. And Apple comes along and or Samsung and they all come along and kill Nokia. And actually, maybe the interesting lesson there is it's a, it's a new technology that comes along and blows the incumbents out of the water. And actually, that's an interesting thing. I think we've become better, certainly in the last 10 years or so, at trying to anticipate what could completely come along and, and destroy some quite large companies who now get completely displaced. So if you, if you go back, we probably did speak five years ago about Netflix or something like that. You know, But there's an example of an industry that's been turned on its head. And some of the incumbents have done quite well out of it, but many new firms have popped up. So that's a long way, Malcolm, of saying um, it's funny how the portfolios change more than you think. Billy Gifford often gets labelled as a tech investor. Is that fair? I think we have to be very clear that we don't... People talk about us as technology investors. We're not technology investors. We're investors in companies that are harnessing technology to create some sort of competitive edge or new business model or indeed entirely new product. I think it's very important to make that distinction. Technology is just now something that all companies have to harness to be successful. You mentioned Netflix earlier, Amazon. Are these still the companies that will drive growth in the future? I think to a lesser extent. We're still fans of both of those companies. You might argue that Amazon is now so big that it's just hard to believe that it can continue to grow in the way that it has been. Although I think there's huge potential in both Amazon and Netflix for them to start to focus more on cash flow generation rather than reinvesting for growth. That probably makes them less interesting to us, but what happens with these companies, and it's happened with the likes of um, Alphabet and Meta, is they just become huge cash generation machines. They're still hugely successful companies. They become of interest to a different type of investor, arguably. I suspect that the next 10 years of growth is going to come from different places. We've maybe had this... um, The last 10 or 15 years has maybe been a very unusual set of circumstances in which you have a, a sort of coincidence of digitalization in the broadest sense and incredibly cheap capital. So you've got companies that don't need a lot of capital. It's very cheap anyway. And in digital type platform businesses, you can roll out globally at very low cost. So this has created this truly remarkable businesses that have very quickly grown up to be these cash generation machines. That may have been almost a one-off set of circumstances. The new things that are happening now, the technologies that are required to change the world, things like electric vehicles and battery manufacturing and new approaches to healthcare, which are the things that are of most interest to us now, 
those are quite capital intensive. So I think we'll see the growth coming from different places. But the more important thing is it's also a different type of growth. You know, you can't build battery gigafactories all over the world without raising a whole lot of capital to do it. So those can still be very successful businesses. But I think the nature and duration and patience, actually, that growth investors are going to need, we're not going to, I don't think we're going to see many really large scale businesses throwing off cash within three years of being launched. I think we're into this kind of much longer duration now. And for us, that's potentially an opportunity, you know, because our starting point here is it's okay if it takes five years. We love companies that are investing heavily as long as there's a path to decent margins and profitability. And give me an example of those areas that might excel and succeed over the next 10 years. So, So I talked about batteries, but it's much wider than that. There's the, essentially we need to completely replace our energy system or electricity system well we need to make much many more things electric and we're very interested in things like um very high-end cables which bring the electricity from the offshore wind turbines on land where it's actually useful once you've laid a cable under the sea you really don't want to be having to fix it so it's a premium product and there's only a couple of providers out there that are really able to do that so that's the point i'm making is the energy transition is not just by a solar panel manufacturer, there are the technology companies that are improving yields from solar panels, there's the cable manufacturers, there's even AI type software companies that will be required to help a smart grid work. So if you've got multiple, I mean, thousands and thousands of sources of generation of electricity, you have this complex grid network you don't have it's not sort of one way pipe anymore from a power station to your house it's incredibly complex to manage all of that so there are companies that are positioning themselves to do that that's so i think there's lots there it's really exciting the other one that's super exciting is health we've got this aging problem demographic problem where healthcare systems are already vastly expensive and it's just getting worse and worse as there are fewer and fewer young people and more and more old people traditional forms of healthcare are becoming more and more expensive Something has to give at some point. Now, what do we do? We don't sort of start um, neglecting old people. We find far more cost-effective ways of dealing with this challenge. What's coming down the line there, I think, is fascinating. We're very early. So this is your world of gene sequencing and gene manipulation. Again, artificial intelligence. It's technologies like, so everyone knows about Moderna now. We invested in Moderna before anyone had heard of Moderna. And it's not a COVID company. We didn't invest in it because we were some crystal ball and saw a pandemic coming. We invested in it because they have a fabulous platform in which they can effectively tell your body to program itself to um, either vaccinate you or treat you against forms of cancer and forms of virus and whatever else. So they're one example of that, but there are many more companies in that area that are pioneering completely different and far more affordable ways to tackle our health problems. It's really interesting because in the here and now, it's very easy to underestimate the sheer rate and scale of progress we're seeing in health innovation. It's phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, and it's it's this, again, it's something we're particularly interested in is how technologies come together to create opportunity. So this is all becoming possible because gene sequencing has dropped by a factor of 100,000 or something in the last 10 years. It's now essentially affordable. But what you get out of sequencing a whole lot of genes, a small population of gene sequencing creates mind-boggling amounts of data, which we wouldn't have been able to do very much with, even six or seven years ago. But now we can harness the processing power that comes from, ultimately from ASML's ability to make better and better machines that make chips. Samsung makes them or TSMC makes them. They then go into ever more powerful computers. We throw AI at computers. We put the genetic data set into the AI machine. And you actually start to identify some patterns which allow us to direct how we try and treat disease. And then we've got the ability to somewhat manipulate genes. And so we can actually use that information to directly treat very specific conditions or indeed widespread conditions, the likes of COVID-19. So, so it's all, how do, how do technologies come together? What has undoubtedly changed over the last five years is higher interest rates, and that seems bad news for growth investors. 
it's fair to say that as a general point, higher interest rates and inflation are very, are unhelpful for growth investors. What people are not fully thinking about is, as ever, it's about the individual companies. If you are, what's what's harder for companies now? If they're not well funded, it's harder to get funding, particularly as we speak. It's harder to get capital. It's more expensive when you do get it. If economic growth in general is slower, maybe it takes you longer for a young company to get to profitability. So that, so let's not pretend nothing has changed. We've been spending a lot of time looking at how much cash have early stage companies got. Can they, are, are they able to get through to profitability? If not, are they have they got secure funding? There's lots of companies that are not profitable but are cash flow generative, and that's often a good thing because that means they're reinvesting their free cash flow for future growth. But the changed environment makes all of that stuff matter more. You can't be a great company if you fail in the meantime. You know, I think we've looked very hard at that. That's been something we've spent a lot of time on in recent years. But the good news is most of the companies that we favour score pretty well in that. Our portfolios are far less indebted and have better cash flow than your average growth companies do. And then there's also, on the inflationary side, you don't have to worry too much about inflation if you have companies that are competitive and providing real value to their customers versus the alternatives and therefore have pricing power. So so this idea you have to, everyone knows you discount at a higher rate so your net present value is lower in a high inflation environment. That doesn't take into account the fact that there are some companies that just offset that by raising their prices and they can because they're providing better value for money in whatever sector it is than their competitors are doing. One of my colleagues said something which made me prick up my ears recently along the lines of share prices can't go up faster than the value added that a company is offering to its customers but what that boils down to is if you're providing real value your customers will stick with you you will have a you'll have some pricing power and in the long run you know as we always say the the share price eventually reflects the value you add that your customers are are getting because that's what they're willing to pay so do you think it's ever played in terms of that link between interest rates and and growth investing and if so why do you think it has been so challenging for growth investors over the last couple of years? I think, because yes, it's overplayed. If you go back to, um, if you look at the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s, I don't think you'll find anything like what people now think is a robust inverse relationship between inflation, interest rates and growth companies. It's a relatively recent phenomenon. And it might be to do with, as we were talking earlier, about really cheap money and sort of special set of circumstances we've seen. So we're now in a position where people almost unthinkingly, in my view, respond, you know, if if inflation interest rates are unexpectedly high or higher than previous expectations, then growth stocks get sold off and and to to a lesser extent the inverse. It comes back to this point, I think, about but not not all growth is equal. I mean it really isn't. And in fact, I mean I would make the argument I would wouldn't I, but I'd make the argument that in the coming few years companies that have grown by borrowing, not being profitable or even having a road to profitability by grabbing market share rather than trying to build a decent business. I think in coming years we will see a big shakeout. I think what we will see is the good companies that haven't just been existing on cheap borrowed money. Their earnings growth will come through. They're still great companies. There are always great companies. As the earnings come through, you don't need a re-rating in the share prices. You just need a, a sort of better understanding of these companies are actually going to come out pretty strongly um, you know and we obviously think we're reasonably good at picking the right ones time will tell you're very close to the investors Stuart give the listener an idea of what's been going on behind the scenes at Bailey Gifford over the last couple of years in terms of looking at our portfolios and stress testing them. Yeah, you know, we've looked back at, should we have done more at the beginning of 2021 to lock in what was a sort of crazy year for outperformance in 2020? And the answer to that, on the whole, is no. I mean, obviously we make mistakes. Um, Often those mistakes come in the form of companies that had great opportunities but executed badly. So is that our mistake? Is it the company's mistake? I mean, I think it's a bit of both, right? I mean, we, we, we should have been able to identify when they're not executing well. So there's been a bit of that. There has been this need to go back through the portfolios in great detail to look and see in this new funding environment, interest rate environment, inflationary environment, are we still satisfied that these companies have pricing power and cash flow strength? 
and in the main they have because those are the sort of characteristics we look for. There have been some where we've come to the view and said, okay, now this is problematic. This, Even if this is potentially a good company, it's hard to see their runway to profitability now. So in, in those cases, we have reduced some holdings. But could we have... I mean, if I had a crystal ball, we'd have sold everything at the end of 2020 and buy it back now. But we can't do that. No, I don't think anyone can do that. So you've got to question whether you should have acted differently, but you also have to carefully understand whether you're imposing hindsight on a decision that you just couldn't have made at the time. To try and get under the hood of what investors have been doing is a lot of that. Could we have done anything differently? No, we don't think we could. Do we still have companies that we think are great in the main? Yes, we do. Are we complacent? I mean, I, I, funnily enough, I have said to some of our investors who, and they don't mean to be glib, but they just say, well, we've got a five-year horizon, so don't measure us over the last three years. You know, I think we've got to go a bit further than that. You know, it, it's been truly extraordinary. So just wait a bit longer isn't really a sufficient answer. So, you know, we've been very strongly encouraging investors to, to go a bit further than that, to think a bit more deeply, to satisfy themselves and their colleagues that, our thesis is still valid and and we haven't found any reason to question that so you know on, on we go i mean thinking differently is absolutely crucial how do we guard against whether it's static thinking or group thinking to ensure our investors and all of us continue to evolve gosh there's a lot in that i think it's a behavioral question how do you create an environment in which you can robustly challenge each other but without negating the optimism and positivity that you need to be a successful investor. You need that. You can't invest if you're so worried about being wrong all the time. We do say, let's think about what might go right, not wrong. And we strongly believe that, but you need to create an environment in which, if you invest that way, you need to be open to challenge. We understand this is your bull case, but what might go wrong? And so we have those discussions in the investment teams, and I think it's facilitated by the nature of the firm. We are a calm and thoughtful and patient organisation, but the outward impression probably doesn't truly reflect how much internal angst we have about what if we're wrong. So that's good up to a point. You know, if it leads you to chopping and changing your portfolios, then that's going to be a terrible outcome. But never believe your own propaganda. I think that's it. We're constantly testing that. And I'm going to completely change the pace now and ask you what book you're reading at the moment. What I actually do read for fun I'm an avid devourer of the golfer's journal. Now, it's not really about golf. It's about people. Individual journeys and relationships are forged. If someone is going through a rough time in their life, men don't generally sit down and have heart-to-hearts. But you know what? A lot of it comes out on the golf course. So it's fascinating. That's a really weird and unexpected answer. But I find that interesting because it's through a very narrow lens. It's a commentary on how people think about their lives and what brings them happiness. I recommend it. But the two main books I'm reading at the moment, one is Michael Lewis's latest effort called Premonition. People know Michael Lewis from Flash Boys and all of that. Ostensibly, it's about the lack of preparedness for a pandemic and obviously pre-COVID-19. And he's gone back and looked at why was there a lack of preparedness? And it's really not a book about pandemics. It's a book about the failures of large organisations to listen to experts within the bureaucracy. I think there are much wider applications. I'm finding it a fascinating book about how do you make sure the right people get heard at the right time. So that's one of them. And the other one is is the economics of fund management. Now, given that I'm a partner in an investment firm, you might think I'm reasonably au fait with that, and I hope I am. But it, it's always good to test your theory, right? So there's a guy called Ed, I don't know how you say his name, Ed Moisson or Moisson, who's written the economics of fund management and I'm, I'm going through that actually and in some ways for certainly for someone in the role that I have it's it's largely reflective of fairly obvious things but nonetheless it's quite helpful to take that step back and see whether there's anything there that raised eyebrows that's a great eclectic mix of reading there and we'll, <laughs> we'll put those titles in the show notes for the podcast so all the listeners can check out those books and the golfers journal Um, uh, when they like. It's been great to have you in the podcast, Stuart. Thanks so much for joining us on Short Briefings on Long Term Thinking. Super. Thanks for having me, Malcolm. We'll see you again in another five years, maybe. And thanks for investing your time in Short Briefings on Long Term Thinking. And you can find our podcast at bailegifford.com 
forward slash podcasts or subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or TuneIn. And if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, why not check out the first series of Invest in Progress, which is Scottish Mortgage's new podcast. This includes interviews by the managers with some of the most transformational growth companies that they invest in. It's been great to have you with us. I hope you enjoyed listening. Wherever you are, in the car, at home or on the way to work, goodbye. Thank you.